Crime Story Disappearance of Three-Year-Old Maddie McCann On the evening of May 3rd, 2007, the peaceful slumber of Madeline McCann, a three-year-old British girl, was shattered as she mysteriously vanished from her bed within a hotel complex situated in Praia da Luz, located in the southern regions of Portugal. This event marked the inception of a high-profile case that, even to this day, remains one of the most notorious unsolved crimes within the nation. Over the span of six years, from 2007 to 2013, diligent efforts by both British and Portuguese investigators unfolded, characterized by an exhaustive examination of case documents and extensive interviews with numerous suspects. Throughout this investigation, the media swirled with sensationalized tales, at times bordering on the absurd, suggesting Madeline's sightings in far-flung locations such as Spain, Italy, Morocco, and even Australia. But what really happened to little Maddie McCann? Choosing a vacation spot Catherine and Gerald McCann, both medical professionals and parents to a trio of children, resided in a charming house located in Leicester, a city situated 170 kilometers away from London. Their family consisted of their eldest daughter, affectionately known as Maddie, who was on the cusp of turning four, and twins, Sean and Amelie, each at the tender age of two. As the approach of spring break beckoned, the McCanns, akin to numerous British families yearning for sunshine and warmth, harbored aspirations of eluding the dreary, fog-shrouded climate of their homeland. Their destination of choice was Portugal, where they intended to spend 10 days. Portugal promised the perfect setting for a delightful vacation, featuring a mere two-hour flight, abundant sunshine, renowned hospitality, delectable cuisine, and relatively affordable prices. Initially, Kate and Jerry had contemplated more exotic locales, such as India or Thailand. However, the prospect of embarking on a long journey with three young children, especially considering Madeline's susceptibility to motion sickness, posed considerable challenges, ultimately guiding their decision towards the sun-kissed shores of Portugal. A little about the hotel. On April 28, 2007, the McCanns embarked on their journey to Portugal. Accompanying them were their friends and their children, all sharing the same destination. Upon their arrival at Lisbon International Airport, the two couples procured rental cars and set off for the southern region of the country, Algarve. By evening, they had completed check-in procedures at the Ocean Club Resort, nestled within the coastal enclave of Praia da Luz. The Ocean Club Resort, a residence hotel catering to the needs of mass tourism, has long been lauded as an ideal choice for family vacations, particularly for those with young children. It continues to be a favored destination among residents of Great Britain and Ireland, attracting a faithful following of returning visitors year after year. Furthermore, the establishment boasts a tranquil ambience and offers an array of amenities specifically tailored to the requirements of small children. Among these amenities, there is a spacious communal pool, along with an exclusive indoor version solely accessible to the hotel's guests. Additionally, the resort enjoys a prime location, with a pristine beach just a short five-minute stroll away. First Days of Vacation Kate, Jerry, and their three children were accommodated in Hotel Room 5A, situated on the first floor. Their initial four days of vacation proved idyllic. The children, closely supervised by their parents and friends, enjoyed their days at the pool, while the evenings were reserved for the adults' dinners at a tapas bar recommended by the hotel's staff. What endeared the restaurant to them most was its convenient proximity to the hotel, just a few short meters away. Each night, prior to heading out for dinner, Kate McCann adhered to a cherished routine she had established for her children since their infancy, ensuring that they all brushed their teeth and donned their pajamas before bedtime. Before extinguishing the lights, she would invariably read them a story, a cherished ritual that Maddie, in particular, held dear. Following these tender moments, Kate would bestow kisses upon her children and then make her way to the restaurant. Content with their vacation experience, the McCanns and their friends were eagerly anticipating a weekend excursion to Lisbon and Porto. They envisioned spending the remainder of their vacation savoring fine wines, embarking on boat excursions, 
and meandering through the enchanting streets of the old town. For the sake of their young children, they had made arrangements to enlist the services of a dedicated babysitter offered by the hotel. The four friends raised their glasses in contentment, confident that their holiday was proceeding splendidly. Disappearance Thursday, May 3rd unfolded as tranquilly as the preceding days. In the morning, Kate and her friend ventured downtown for some shopping, while Jerry and another fellow father ushered the children to the seashore. They planned to rendezvous in the evening at their cherished eatery, where they were now regarded as seasoned patrons. Around 8.30 p.m., Kate prepared for dinner. Prior to tucking the children into bed, she spun a brief bedtime tale. Jerry, already en route to secure a reservation, had left. Maddie, the youngest of the three, entreated her mother to linger a little longer, and Kate held her daughter's hand until sleep enveloped her. After ensuring all three youngsters were in slumber, Kate quietly exited the room, slightly ajar the patio door. The tapas bar was a mere 100 meters away, facilitating easy access for the couple to intermittently check on their children over the coming hours. At approximately 8.45 p.m., the McCanns and their friends convened at their dining table. A short while later, one of their companions, while attending to her own child, cast a cursory glance towards room 5A, yet discerned nothing amiss. Satisfied, she returned to the restaurant. Some 15 to 20 minutes later, around 9.05 p.m., Jerry undertook a similar check. Also finding nothing out of the ordinary in the children's quarters, Maddie and the twins remained soundly asleep. He did observe, however, that the door to the children's bedroom was unexpectedly wide open, though his wife later reassured him that she had securely closed it. With only passing consideration, he rejoined the group at the bar, and the evening progressed as usual. At 10 p.m., it was Kate's turn to carry out the next inspection of their apartment. She traversed the 100-meter distance separating the tapas bar from the hotel, circled the pool, and, in an attempt to minimize any noise, stealthily entered the suite to ensure the children's well-being. Kate proceeded into the children's room, only to be met with a horrifying sight. The window stood wide open, though she distinctly recollected securing it before they had departed for dinner. Growing increasingly frantic, Kate rushed to the twins' beds. Amelia and Sean still slumbered peacefully, but as she moved towards the small crib positioned by the window, where Maddie had been sleeping, she was struck by the realization that it was now unoccupied. Trembling, Kate swiftly turned over the covers, scrutinized beneath the bed and inside the closet. Yet Maddie was nowhere to be found. With a surge of anxiety, she combed the room, surveyed her own bedroom, inspected the patio, and scoured the balcony. But there was no trace of her daughter. They've taken her. They've kidnapped her. Kate's screams pierced the air as she descended into a frenzied state. The commotion summoned concerned neighbors from neighboring suites, and the hotel porter, responsible for these rooms, hastened to investigate. Amidst her sobs, Kate conveyed the nightmarish truth, her daughter had vanished without a trace. The other tenants swiftly initiated floor-by-floor -floor searches, while some attempted to console the distraught mother, who repeated in anguish, They've taken her, she's been stolen. Five minutes later, Jerry McCann and their friends, alarmed by the cries, returned to the hotel where a state of general alert had been declared. The receptionist fielded calls from the police and various services, as Jerry and Kate teetered on the brink of a nervous breakdown. Their anxiety only mounted with time, as the police did not arrive until an hour later at 11.10 p.m. The search begins. The police, assisted by hotel staff and a few residents, meticulously combed the entire hotel complex. This exhaustive search persisted until approximately 5 a.m., regrettably yielding no substantial leads. Signotitias, the local television station, upon learning of Madeline's disappearance, dispatched journalists to the scene. They commenced interviewing witnesses and naturally sought a statement from the parents. Jerry, alongside his wife, delivered the following statement. Words cannot capture the anxiety and fear that consume us in the face of our daughter Madeline's disappearance. We implore anyone with even the most trivial information about her vanishing to contact the Portuguese police and aid us in reuniting her with us. Thank you. He beseeched the supposed kidnapper with trembling words. If you have Madeline, I implore you, please do not harm her. She's a gentle, innocent child. 
I beg you, allow her to return to us, to her little brother and sister. The following morning, the entire nation of Portugal awoke to the sight of Maddie's visage dominating the news. The fact that the disappearance had occurred in such a secure location left everyone in astonishment. Swiftly, the entire country was put on high alert. Border checkpoints, Portuguese and Spanish airports, and the ports frequented by cruise ships and ferries all became hubs for vigilance and awareness. Hot on the heels of the incident. Simultaneously, the investigative efforts at the Ocean Club pressed on. Word had spread among some tourist families who had begun to gather, but the police counseled against departing the complex until the initial inquiries were completed. On the morning of May 4th, the ground search extended beyond the hotel's perimeter. Fearing the possibility of a child having strayed to the water, the police commenced combing the shoreline and the nearby river, though it was more of a creek. Maddie's image was shared with all tourists and local residents, yet no one reported spotting her along the coast or elsewhere. It was during this phase that an unexpected challenge emerged. Kate's response, or rather her silence, confounded the Portuguese police. She steadfastly declined to address even the most routine questions typically posed to parents in such circumstances. Contrary to all expectations, Jerry followed suit, displaying an extraordinary composure and seeming to derive an unusual satisfaction from their mutual silence. The Portuguese authorities, perplexed by the unconventional conduct of the parents, made persistent efforts to coax Kate and Jerry into dialogue. They grappled with the enigma of what could be driving their silence, shock or a desire to conceal the facts. Regardless, it exacerbated the situation and impeded the ongoing investigation. Rapidly, the British couple fell into disfavor not only with the Portuguese law enforcement, under the charge of police inspector Goncalo Amaral, but also a considerable portion of the local populace. Their perceived detachment and indifference towards their daughter's disappearance stirred a wave of criticism and discontent within the Portuguese community. Meanwhile, there remained no trace of Maddie or any indication of her purported abductor. Back in England, the news of the girl's vanishing swiftly escalated to a national concern. Her radiant visage was a persistent presence in newspapers and on television screens, and an outpouring of supportive messages from the public began to inundate the distraught parents. Unexpected Details The investigations in Portugal were ongoing, with the Algarve police station actively interrogating the hotel's residents who had been present on the night of Maddie's disappearance. Special attention was directed towards the guests residing one floor above the McCann family. Strangely, these individuals denied any knowledge of the McCanns checking on their children every half hour that evening. They even claimed to have heard little Madeline's cries and calls for her mother, but none of the parents had deemed it necessary to come to the child's aid. The police took this testimony with the utmost seriousness. Shortly thereafter, another peculiar report emerged, originating from an Irish tourist named Nuala Smith, who had also been at the hotel on the day of Maddie's disappearance. According to Smith, she had witnessed Gerald McCann speaking to an unfamiliar dark-haired man from her balcony. The man was carrying a little girl clad in pink pajamas, and she emphasized that she had not seen him at the hotel prior to that moment. The man proceeded towards the beach, carrying the child in an odd manner like a bag. It's worth noting that the Ocean Club Hotel Complex did not possess the security typical of a gated community. Anyone could freely traverse its grounds, whether they were guests or casual passers-by. Nevertheless, this freedom had never concerned the vacationers because Praia Dallas had cultivated a reputation as an exceptionally safe haven to the extent that many tourists didn't even bother to lock their doors at night. Suspicions are growing. Based on this crucial testimony, deemed of utmost importance by the police, a decision was made to deploy a canine team to thoroughly examine the McCann's hotel room, seeking traces that may have eluded investigators during the initial search. Upon the entry of the search dogs into apartment 5A, two sniffer canines immediately exhibited signs of apprehension by taking refuge behind a couch in the living room. Both dogs began to bark and signaled the detection of a distinct odor suggesting the presence of something deceased. A closer inspection of the room, including the kitchen and bathroom, revealed small bloodstains along the edge of the sink and within the shower tray. 
The following day, the police opted to examine the McCann's rental car again with the assistance of the same dogs, who detected a peculiar scent emanating from the trunk of the vehicle. However, the suspicions surrounding Kate and Jerry were compounded when the authorities discovered packages of potent depressants and sleeping pills within their medicine cabinet. To account for the presence of these medications, Kate broke her silence and disclosed that she occasionally administered them to her children in minimal doses, asserting that all three struggled with insomnia and resisted bedtime. She emphasized her awareness of the risks associated with these substances and potential addiction, underlining her competence as a doctor to determine the appropriate dosages for young children. Police Opinion the Portuguese police interpreted these statements as a potential confession, believing they had unraveled the enigma surrounding the mysterious disappearance. Their confidence in the parents' involvement grew progressively stronger. According to the authorities, they postulated that Madeline had met a tragic end, and Catherine and Gerald had orchestrated a tale of disappearance to evade accountability for her murder. Investigators contemplated two plausible scenarios. One involved a fatal accident in which one of the parents unintentionally caused Madeline's demise, leading them to contrive a kidnapping narrative to obfuscate the truth. In the second scenario, it was theorized that Kate, in her desire for a tranquil dinner, may have inadvertently administered an excessive dosage of sleeping pills to her daughter, resulting in her unintended death. Supporting these suspicions was the initial assertion by Kate McCann to her friends that, upon entering the children's room on the night of the disappearance, she had promptly discerned signs of a break-in, with a shattered window and scattered glass. However, Kate subsequently recanted this statement, admitting that it had been given in a moment of emotional distress, as the police had determined that the shutters remained intact, and none of the windows displayed any evidence of forced entry. Nonetheless, the absence of substantial evidence to warrant charging Catherine and Gerald left the investigation at an impasse. In spite of this, the Portuguese police, the local media, and the residents were astonished by the perceived unemotional demeanor of the parents, condemning them for their apparent lack of sentiment. It was acknowledged that such behavior might be attributed to the reserved nature of the British, which was often misunderstood by those from more expressive southern cultures. As the media reported, a Portuguese mother would weep, scream, and create a commotion. The composed and unemotional demeanor exhibited by Gerald and Catherine McCann seems incomprehensible almost theatrical, and even heartless, about Maddie's parents, Catherine Healy, hailing from England, and Gerald Patrick McCann, originally from Scotland, first crossed paths in 1992 during their medical school years. Both born in 1968, Kate in Liverpool and Jerry in Glasgow, the McCann family could be characterized as belonging to the affluent middle class, Jerry McCann who specialized in cardiology, earned his doctoral degree in 2002. Kate, too, obtained her doctorate, specializing in obstetrics and gynecology. Confronted with fertility challenges, the couple resorted to artificial insemination to start a family. Their first child, Madeline, was born on May 12, 2003, and two years later, they welcomed twins into their lives, a girl named Amelie and a boy named Sean. The McCann family resides in a middle-class neighborhood in Leicester and continues to lead a comfortable lifestyle. They have provided their children with a private education and remain engaged in their medical professions. Jerry earns an annual income of approximately £75,000. In addition to his primary role as a practitioner at Glenfield Hospital, he serves as a professor at Leicestershire University, where he instructs three times a week. While the family was accustomed to traveling abroad regularly, the 2007 trip to Portugal marked a unique departure from their usual routine. Kate later explained that the selection of this destination was somewhat impromptu, as they had run out of time to book a hotel elsewhere. Family and close friends have consistently depicted the couple as affectionate, and harmonious. However, in the eyes of those less acquainted with them, as reported in tabloids and the media, they are sometimes portrayed as calculating, acquisitive, and self-interested individuals who perpetually endeavor to craft the facade of an ideal family. Other Suspects 
In early 2008, the Portuguese police identified a new suspect, Robert Murat, a 33-year-old Scottish tourist who happened to be vacationing in Praia da Luz at the time. Notably, he had a previous involvement in a case related to a relationship with a minor. The basis for suspicion rested on his mother's testimony, who claimed to have observed him watching Maddie for extended periods, particularly while she was swimming in the pool. Robert Murat vehemently denied any involvement in the case and provided an alibi, noting that he had been in Lisbon on the day of the child's disappearance. After scrutinizing the evidence he presented, which included a train ticket, and receipts from a restaurant and bar, his alibi was verified, leading to the dismissal of all charges against him. Similar circumstances unfolded for Kate and Jerry, who had endured prolonged scrutiny by the Portuguese police. Eventually, they were exonerated due to the absence of incriminating evidence. The traces of blood found in the room were attributed to the girl's father. Following these developments, the investigation came to a standstill. Police Inspector Gonzalo Amaral, who had previously leveled allegations against the McCanns, stepped down from his position. In Portugal, due to the absence of compelling evidence, Maddie's case was officially put on hold in July 2008. However, to allay public concerns, the authorities affirmed that the investigation would be reopened should new evidence emerge. Returning to England Nevertheless, Kate and Jerry, along with their twins, returned to England but remained resolute in their quest to find their daughter. Even to this day, the McCanns periodically make television appearances. Subsequently, they made a direct appeal to the then British Prime Minister, David Cameron, who, in response, called for a renewed inquiry into the case. The British police dedicated two full years to meticulously examining the extensive case file. In the course of the reinvigorated investigation commencing in 2009, a team of 37 detectives grappled with what seemed like a complex conundrum. The investigation dossier comprised over 100,000 pages, composed in Portuguese and poorly organized, presenting a daunting challenge in terms of where to commence. Andy Redwood, one of the lead inspectors, undertook a Herculean effort, making regular trips to Portugal twice a week. Unfortunately, despite his unwavering dedication, no substantial progress was achieved in the investigation. Opinions of Famous Personalities Subsequently, the McCanns established the website LookForMaddie.com, serving as an illustrated personal blog chronicling the case's evolution from its inception and receiving periodic updates. The website also provided visitors with the opportunity to contribute funds to find Maddie. In just a few months, Catherine and Gerald managed to amass over £1.5 million. This financial support was allocated to cover the expenses of private investigators enlisted by the family, in addition to financing the parents' own efforts in the search for Madeline. Throughout different phases of their ordeal, the family garnered support from soccer enthusiasts, musical groups, notably Simple Minds dedicated a song titled Don't You Forget About Me, soccer luminaries such as Cristiano Ronaldo and David Beckham, Prime Minister Gordon Brown, and even the royal family. Billionaire Richard Branson displayed solidarity by offering the McCanns the use of a private jet facilitating their journeys across the globe in pursuit of their daughter. Consequently, Maddie's parents ventured to at least 14 countries in response to reported leads. Simultaneously, they conducted press conferences worldwide, maintaining their hope of one day locating their daughter alive and well. Worth noting, in 2011, they received a high-profile audience with Pope Benedict XVI, who celebrated a mass in Maddie's honor and offered blessings to the parents in their ongoing quest. Opposition Nevertheless, in England, as well as in other places, numerous individuals continue to harbor doubts regarding the innocence of the parents. Some acquaintances of Kate have gone as far as describing her as a feisty and disagreeable person who does not adequately care for her children. In an intriguing turn of events, during an interview with CNN, 
Journalist Martin Brandt attempted to pose challenging questions to Catherine and Gerald in an effort to elicit an emotional response. However, the couple, holding hands, responded to even the most uncomfortable inquiries with composure, albeit a lingering sense of unease in their words. Body language experts scrutinizing the interview reiterated what the Portuguese police had long suspected that the McCanns were highly likely involved in their daughter's disappearance. According to these experts, the husband and wife exhibited the demeanor of seasoned deceivers, adhering meticulously to a predetermined narrative. For instance, upon learning that Goncalo Amaral, the Portuguese police inspector who initially handled the case, had authored a book accusing Kate and Jerry of concealing evidence, the McCanns pursued a libel lawsuit against him. This legal action resulted in the removal of the book from circulation and a substantial monetary settlement to the McCants. This development ultimately solidified the Portuguese police's belief that it was Jerry and Kate who had a hand in their daughter's demise, contriving the entire narrative as a means to profit from it. Another Attempted Investigation in 2012, experts in facial morphology crafted a portrait of Maddie as a 13-year-old, which garnered global media attention but ultimately yielded no breakthroughs. By that time, hope of finding Maddie in the UK was waning. The investigation had long been caught in a cycle, showing no signs of progress over the years. However, a sudden development in July 2013 led to the case's reopening. At the time, British authorities believed they had stumbled upon a promising lead. This particular lead revolved around two Scottish tourists, who had been present at the Ocean Club Hotel during the same period as the McCann family. Following a series of intensive interrogations, Charles McNeil and Billy Lochlin were eventually released. Simultaneously, Portuguese police received a flurry of tips. One tipster claimed to have spotted Maddie in a Roma camp in Spain, while another alleged seeing her being led by a homeless woman in the city of Genoa, Italy. A photo was even procured, snapped by a French tourist, featuring a girl resembling Maddie asleep in a rural location in northern Morocco. To the credit of the police, they diligently investigated each of these accounts, but none were substantiated. Between July and November 2013, numerous individuals in Portugal, England, and Scotland were questioned and, in some instances, detained, only to be later released without charges. In early December 2014, a new suspect emerged on the horizon 72-year-old Roderick McDonagh from Wales, who had a prior conviction for unlawful contact with a minor in Spain and Cyprus. He was reportedly cited in Praia da Olas in 2007, just two or three days before Maddie's disappearance. However, once again, this lead turned out to be a dead end, as Roderick McDonagh provided a solid alibi. The next development in the case harked back to July 2015, when an enigmatic suitcase containing unidentified remains was discovered in Australia. The connection between this discovery and Maddie's disappearance remained unclear. Nevertheless, DNA analysis failed to confirm any link between the remains and the McCann's daughter. Christian Bruckner Almost 15 years after the ordeal began, in June 2020 a new lead emerged. This time, the suspect was a true criminal from Germany, Christian Bruckner, a native of Brunswick. At the age of 40, he had committed several offenses against children and minors and had served two prison sentences in Germany and Austria since the late 1980s. Portuguese authorities had already been aware of him, as the suspect had worked and lived in the Algarve between 1994 and 2007. During his time in Portugal, he was involved in various crimes, including armed robbery, exhibitionism, theft, altercations in bars, drug usage, and trafficking. Adding to the list, Christian Bruckner had been convicted in 2001 for a sexual assault on an American tourist while vacationing in Praia Dallas. Exploiting his conditional release, he was released from prison in 2005 and reverted to the same lifestyle he had led before incarceration. His presence in Praia Dallas was reported in 2007, precisely when the McCann family was vacationing at the hotel. 
During a fresh examination of the case, investigators from three countries, England, Portugal, and Germany uncovered numerous peculiar coincidences that had previously been overlooked for some reason. Notably, Bruckner's cell phone tracking affirmed that he resided in close proximity to the Ocean Club at the time. Moreover, he had stayed at the same hotel on several occasions prior to his arrest by the police for settling a bill with a stolen credit card. Upon searching Christian's mobile home, law enforcement discovered various baby items and a multitude of compromising photographs. However, despite the mounting evidence, he managed to evade the charges. Several months later, he was incarcerated in Germany on a drug trafficking case, where he is expected to remain for at least four more years. Nevertheless, investigators regard him as the most probable kidnapper, and will strive to establish his culpability. I hope you like this story. Please don't forget to leave a comment sharing with your thoughts below. Give a thumbs up this video. And remember to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating stories. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey and we'll see you in the next video.